pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know that you are well aware of life and its ups and downs and the challenges that those face in particular these vulnerable areas from Puerto Rico to southwest Florida, all the way through the state and then the Carolinas, etc. Lord, you're aware. And as Pastor Edie said, we pray today for those who are representing your love and your strength, as well as those who are clinging, clinging to life and trying to find hope. We do thank you for our ministry partners, the Assemblies of God, Convoy of Hope. We thank you for Hal Donaldson. We thank you for their leadership. We thank you for their willingness to go and be the first to show and the last to leave, representing really the gospel, the good news of the love of God through Christ Jesus. Strengthen them today, those who are driving and delivering goods and having conversations and praying with folks and offering hope. Strengthen and bless them today to be the blessing you've called them to be at this time. But we do pray also for local churches and pastors and ministries who, are, who have been directly impacted and have scrambled this weekend to try and, to try and find a place or a way to connect with the body of Christ, to rally in faith, and to give you the worship you deserve, and to begin to serve those in their community. We pray that the presence of the Holy Spirit will be felt more now than ever in those believers, those pastors, those church gatherings. As they aim to exalt Jesus, I pray that your word will come true, and that people will be drawn to you. Again, Lord, I thank you for the chance to partner with our missions partners literally around the world through the giving to the Assembly of Gods through Global Impact here at Calvary Assembly and in this particular way today as we give to Convoy of Hope and perhaps through the church today we give collectively and we pray your kingdom advance through all of this. Let good come of it. Let your presence be felt. Let faith be stirred. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. So as implied, I know that you are so faithful to tithe to the local ministries of the church online and in the room and drop boxes in the foyer like that. And then, of course, global impact and missions and faith promises, Pastor Edie mentioned. And then you may have it in your heart to support a credible, um, timely ministry partner like Convoy of Hope. And so you can give today and just simply mark that gift, Convoy of Hope, and uh, and they will be on the scene, they are on the scene, and they will continue to represent the love of Christ and the good news of Jesus along with the tangible uh, supplies that people need. So praise the Lord for your generosity. I'm going to invite you this morning to turn to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to ask you to turn there today, and maybe you can flip open your phone, your iPad, whatever it is you bring to church. Maybe it's the pages you want to turn, but we'll have some of the verses up there for you today, of course. But uh, it will be really helpful for you to see some of these scriptures you know, as we think about all that's gone on with Hurricane Ian this past week, we can't help but to be empathetic, you know, and put ourselves in their shoes and just wonder what it would have been like to, a week ago, be watching the news and listening on the edge of our sofas in our, in our love seats in our living rooms to the forecasters as they do their very best to uh, take in computer models and satellite imagery and radar and, 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 and explain to the people along the coast of Florida, uh, where they believe that hurricane would make landfall. And they do their very best. And, and the reason they do that is because they want people to be ready. They do everything they can. They, the government gets involved. They, uh, they issue evacuational mandates. And they change the one-way roads to another way. And they do everything they can. And then the people in their homes do everything they can including running the, you know, the local stores and buying plywood and, and, and covering up their windows and, and uh, taking their resources, their, you know, their goods or important papers and putting them in a safe place and uh, maybe moving their loved ones to, to higher ground or another location. I, like Pastor Edie, have a friend who lives in Tampa. We could go at this time. They expected all the devastation that hit Fort Myers. It was possible to hit there, but they really thought it would target the Tampa Bay area. And I called and... and Checked in on my buddy the other day as he was traveling up uh, to Alabama uh, the day literally that the hurricane was expected to, to hit, and thankfully he's thankful that his area was spared of the brunt of things. 
But what dawned on me is that, that people want to be ready. You want to be ready. You want to be ready for whatever life's forecast holds for you. Uh, we can't always see what tomorrow holds. We don't always know the unexpected situations and circumstances. We don't know how high the, 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 the surge will be in life in, in the coming days, weeks, or months. But it's helpful if we have a little bit of an inclination as to what is coming down the pike. And I would say that it's true not only in terms of our fears, but even in our hopes. We want to be able to plan for the best, amen? We want to be able to look forward with confidence and, and, and make promises to our children that we can keep. And we want to do everything. Everyone seems to be really either hooked on the past or really hoping for the future. And I think we can learn from our past, but in Christ and in faith in Christ, we need to lean forward to the plans and the purposes that God has for us. Amen? As we thought about communion today and God's grace for us today as Pastor Chris led us. I hope that you were able to pray through some things and surrender some things, maybe some things from the past, maybe some habits, maybe some hang-ups mentally and emotionally. It's time to be liberated in Jesus' name, to move forward in the plans that God has for us. His future is bright and his plans will prevail whether we choose to be ready or not. And so while we think about the future, we would love to know what the economy holds. We would love to know if and when it's the right time to take a, a mortgage loan out and what will happen with the rates. Will they ever come back down or will they hit you know, double digits? We would love to know exactly what to do. Uh, we would love to know what's going to happen with the upcoming elections and how that's going to affect our way of life. And you sports people would love to know what's going to happen with the season, right, with, with your fantasy football and all that stuff. But, but here's the thing, God loves us so much that not only out of his grace and goodness he provided for us, and we've celebrated the most precious and impactful provision of God, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, for our, our sins to be forgiven and our future to be, be bright. But the Bible, because God loves us, is also, uh, it gives us a glimpse into the future for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ. It gives us a glimpse into the future for those of us who have not placed our faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible lets us know some things, and I'll just reference a few. For one thing, life as we know it extends beyond this life. Another thing, the brokenness and the pain in this world is not going to last forever. We know that God will make all things new, the Bible tells us, and he will write... Every wrong, every injustice will be justified. In renowned author Tolkien's book, The Return of the King, Gandalf is asked, is everything sad going to come untrue? The Bible gives a resounding promise. The answer, as illogical as it sounds, is a resounding yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes to those of us who are believers in G Jesus Christ, and I want to encourage you today in your faith and in your optimism and in your hope for tomorrow and to be ready for the Lord's return. He writes and says that when it comes to the future for the believer in Christ, you can't even imagine how great it's going to be. Some of you have graduated loved ones on. They've transitioned in faith in Christ, from here to the forever there. And as much as we grasp a hold of some of the biblical truths about the there, the Bible makes it very clear, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can comprehend or imagine what God has prepared for those who love and trust the Lord. That's your destinational promise. That's the promise of God for all of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of sin, adoption by grace into the family of God, as Pastor Chris said earlier, we will enjoy an incredible feast there. Almost every religion in the world has something to say about the end times. Almost all of them agree that, well, things, as we, things here as we know them will probably get worse, but the Bible is, is very distinct and very different than many of these major religions. The Bible tells us to focus on the fact that while things will intensify here and now in the end times, the end holds great hope for believers in Jesus Christ. 
You mean to tell me, Pastor Dan, I can have great hope when I watch the devastation on the news, whether it's weather-related or, or race-related or, or war-related or pipeline-related? You mean I can have hope that in the end, God will make things all new? Yes, the Bible declares that, and we declare it to be our blessed hope. Jesus compares the end of all things to labor pains. You moms can relate. The kind of pain that has a promise attached to it. Hurt that has hope mixed in with it. Jesus will come again. And he'll come again similar to the way that he departed. In Acts chapter 1, if you were to flip over there, you would see Jesus having his final conversation with his closest disciples. Those who followed and obeyed. And he said to them, I need you to be my witnesses. And I need you to pray. And I need you to seek and wait on the presence of the Holy Spirit. So that you can be my effective witnesses. Because I'm going away. But you have a role to play. We've talked about it for the literal, literally the last six weeks, what the call of God is on our lives as disciples of God, growing as disciples, helping others grow in discipleship and following Jesus and, and spreading the gospel near and far through our mission's partners, faith promises. But Jesus is talking to them in Acts chapter 1, and, and when he finishes this statement, he literally ascends and disappears into the cloud. There, there's... There's no punchline, it's just, hey, I'm coming back one day, and in the meantime, you have a call of God on your life, and I'm enduing you with power to live this thing out. Don't become complacent, and he literally ascends. The disciples are uh, awestruck, they're looking around, they're somewhat confused, they don't really understand, like, when, okay, wait, is he coming back right now? Like, what are we waiting for? And two men dressed in white, angels appear. You can look at it there in about verse 11 in Acts chapter 1, and, and they basically say, hey, no worries, get on with it. The same way you saw Jesus go, one day, ready or not, here he comes. And so we have this blessed hope. Today I want us to be reminded of some old news that's still good news. A forecast of sorts Jesus headlined for his disciples 2,000 years ago. And he said, I want you to be ready. I want you to be prepared for the future. There are going to be moments where you're not sure. There are going to be moments you have doubts. There are going to be moments you're going to be tempted to kind of come off the cutting edge of where I've called you and led you to be. But I want you to live in light of my promise for these end times and this blessed hope. I want you to live in light of the future. There will be a culmination of things Jesus would explain to them in the end times. An end of an era. Many will claim to know the precise details. They'll claim to predict the day and the hour of the coming of the Lord. And Jesus makes it perfectly clear in Matthew chapter 24 and in other places. Uh, don't fall for these false claims. Only God the Father knows. Jesus gave signs and symptoms of the forecast labor pains. Uh, I've seen the earth seemingly be in labor more and more <laughs> lately. One sign that Jesus makes clear and the Bible makes clear as that is what I've already implied. The evil in the world will increase. If you're one of those Christians who keep praying that it's going to get better, you need to read the Bible. And I'm glad you're here today. And you need to muster up your faith and build on a strong foundation. Because it's kind of like there's a storm coming. And we need to be ready. And we can be ready in Christ. This sign that Jesus references, and we'll read it in a moment, he said that the wickedness and the evil in the world, how many of you recognize, I hope you recognize that there's a lot of that in our world. Jesus said, as the end times approach, and your hope can be stirred up for my coming back to be reunited with you, you will notice that the wickedness in the world will be so bad, it will be comparable to the days of Noah. Now, you don't have to turn there. I'll show you, but just a couple of verses to help you get the, the taste of what Jesus is referencing from Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Noah, the flood. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all of the time. Just, I, I just want you to think about that 
And I, and I want you to think about the world we live in. I want you to think about how challenging it is to watch the news. I, I, want, I want you to think about flipping through social media and looking for the funny things that you enjoy and how many ungodly, wicked things you've got to filter out or pretend are not there in order to get your kicks. I just want you to think about the wicked standards of our world and the trend on which they are going. Jesus goes on in verse 6, not Jesus, but Genesis says this about Noah's time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Wow. Can I just say this to you? When your heart is deeply troubled with the wickedness and the lies and the scheming of this world, realize you're not alone. The Lord's heart is heavy. The Lord grieves over wickedness. And it's not a time to become spiritually arrogant. And it's not a time to kind of throw stones. It's time, as we said earlier, to pray. You need to be very careful. So Jesus, here it is. Here are the words of Jesus that I've set you up for. Again, we're thinking about the Lord's word. Ready or not, here I come. This is Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. And Jesus is talking about the end times. But about that day, that hour, no one knows. He goes on to say, but the Father. Verse 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's another phrase for Jesus Christ. Another name. Verse 38, for in the days before the flood, again, this is Jesus talking, hundreds of years after the flood to his disciples, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Let's just pause for a sec. That's kind of like the party, the beach party, continuing on Sanibel Island until the day when it was too late to do so. And Jesus is saying, unfortunately, there will be a lot of people in the end times, in a wicked era, who will just keep partying on. As if nothing, no storm, no wake-up call, no accounting will be done. He goes on, for in the days before the flood, these people were having a party, verse 39, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. I, I know it, there's mixed emotions in the room because part of us wants to shout, Hallelujah, we've got to be getting close. And then there's a, there's a heart in some of us who say, Oh dear Jesus, the way it was prayed in the fireside room pre-service. Lord, give us one more day to witness to our family and friends. He gives examples as Jesus always does. Remember, I don't want you to miss the potency. This is Jesus talking, right? Two men in that day will be working in the field, and one will have been a believer in Christ Jesus, a sinner saved by grace. Another phrase he uses is born again spiritually. So one of the men in this situation is one of those folks like do I have any of those folks in the room today? You understand what I'm talking about, about being born again, saved by grace? Let me see a hand as a witness to everyone else in the room. Let me see a hand to the glory of God. Please raise your hand if you're a believer. In now give him praise for salvation. Come on. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah. He gives another example. There'll be two women. They'll be, um, I think they're, they're, they're grinding some, they're making flour, I think is what it says for pizza. I think it's pizza they're making. And... And, and one of them will have been, all my Italian brothers and sisters said amen, hallelujah. Amen. And all of my people who love Italian food equally, amen. amen. Come on. And Jesus said one of these women will be making the flour for the pizza and, and the other one will be left and one of them will be reunited with, with her Lord. Blessed hope. So then here's what Jesus says in verse 42. And, and again, think of it this way. Jesus is speaking to disciples. And we did a whole series, I hope you were here, and if not, I hope you're online, on what it means to be a disciple. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus' words are relevant for you today. He says, so in light of all of that, therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. It's like when you were a kid, playing hide and go seek, and you find that special 
hiding place under the bed, behind the door, in the shrubs, up the tree, and you hear that person who's hiding their eyes, three, two, one, ready or not, here I come. Jesus says you need to be on watch. Then one day in Noah's era, the rain came. The time for repentance was over. Judgment was at the door. Noah was ready. Others were not. Unfortunately, this week we've, saw, we've seen images. Some people were ready when the hurricane struck. Others were not. We pray for all of them equally. Noah had readied the ark. He and his family survived the flood. And we too need to watch and be ready, staying faithful to God as Noah was and as the disciples learned to be. Jesus goes on. You want to hear some more words of Jesus about the times in which we're approaching and living in? Amen? Verse 43, Matthew 24. So in light of all that, Jesus says, stand watch, but understand this. Now when Jesus says, hey, that's like Jesus said, hey, you're falling asleep on me. Pay attention. Understand this. In other words, don't just listen to this. Don't just check, I went to church today off on the list. Make sure you don't, get, don't miss this. Get this. If the owner, and I give us another picture, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broke into. So you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So it's, it's very similar to the forecasters, the professional meteorologists, saying, hey, you need to get ready for it. Something big is about to happen. You need to get ready. And, and it's, it's like people just ignoring it. Beach party. String up the lantern lights. And let's get some more marshmallows on the fire. And let's party. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Jesus said, it's kind of like if you owned a home and, and you were able, like I said earlier, to see into the future like we all wish sort of we could. And, and you knew that there was someone coming and, and there was something big, was gonna, a thief was coming in the middle of the night, let's just say. You would love to be able to know at what time to put the lights on, what time to call 911, what time to, you know, offer them a piece of pizza in the name of Jesus upside the head. You need to know what time. If you knew what time, you would do something about it. Right? Implied? Wouldn't we do something about it? So Jesus is, is saying, you need to be ready. Jesus is having this conversation recorded in the Gospels so that, church, you and, 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 and I, we can be ready today. Ready or not, Jesus comes for some like a thief in the night. That does not need to be the case for you. Because we have the words of Jesus telling us what to look forward to. Amen? Hallelujah? Here's what Jesus is saying. Those spiritually awake will be prepared. They won't be caught off guard. Those distracted by the things of this world, self-indulgences met with self-justification, will not be ready. So here's what we see Jesus saying. You want to be ready for the Lord's return? Amen? Amen? Number one, be watchful. That means every single day. That means when we pray and we close out the service, you're saying, Lord, this week I want to live as if you were coming back. You might come back tomorrow. I may not even go back to work tomorrow. But I will work hard as unto the Lord if I do. Number two is that we be found when he returns living faithful lives. Living right when he does show Jesus talks specifically about that, and, and because we can watch while we live, we still need to live right. There was this old theory Christians decades ago would just say, well, hey, we think the end times are now, and we believe Jesus might come back tomorrow, so we're going to just stop working, we're going to just go into debt, and we're going to just live irresponsibly. Well, that represents Christ real well. No, that's not what he's called us to do. Colossians tells us everything we do. When we work, we work as unto the Lord, and we're a witness. People ought to be asking, why is your attitude and your effort so stellar in the workplace? Why do you offer mercy and grace to other people when it would be so easy not to? Because everything I do comes out of my love for the Lord. 
because he loved me and he served me, he gave his life for me. So, so the real challenge for us is to not only stay alert and to be watchful, but to live right until he comes. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Jesus is not giving us this chapter so that all we do is come together and talk about what he said in this chapter. Like knowing the future is given to us by Christ so that we can live the here and now to his glory faithfully. That's why we understand these things. So, things. so we can live faithful as disciples of Jesus Christ each day, every Sunday, whatever it is, wherever we go, every day at work, at school. Jesus goes on now to really talk about living life faithfully. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Oh, that's good. Just don't miss that. Faithful and wise. So, so I'm going to tell you what he's going to do here. He's going to say, you're either this type of servant, child of God, or you're, or you're that type of Christian. You're either going to be this one, and this is the one you want to be. I'm going to tell you right now. It sounds pretty good, right? Well, how did he describe us? Possibly we could be faithful and wise. How many of you want to lean into that camp? Faithful and wise. Godly wisdom. That's what we're talking about. So let's talk about what Jesus said. In the meantime, before I come back, as wickedness grows, and I'm going to meet my people one day in the air, here's what he says. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master, and that would be the Lord, has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of more things. So what is Jesus saying? Be faithful until I return. Live out what I have called you to live out. Be the child of God I died for you to become. Live life endued by and, in, and uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Live life on mission. You may not be called to go far, and you might be. But every day, wherever your feet will trod, represent me well. That's what Jesus is saying. Faithful and wise servant of God found doing the things God has called us to do when he returns. I want to be that guy. I want this church to be that church. I want the church to be that church. Amen? One commentary writes, Jesus requires, listen carefully, faithfulness while we wait for his return. Our faithfulness may not just involve personal devotion. It sometimes, listen, also involves caring for others and helping them in their walk with God. That is growing together as disciples. That is our follow Jesus option we've been talking about for a month and a half. God is looking to reward those who are faithful. So, if we are watchful and we're faithful, then I guess it's logical to expect that the way we live will reveal to those around us that we love the Lord and are expecting his return, which gives us a platform to explain Jesus to people. Amen? Verse 48, Jesus continues. Now remember what I told you. He's going to say, you can be found. When I come back, Jesus says, and we're reunited, you're either going to be like this, faithful and wise, servant, or like that. So now he's going to say what that is. But suppose that servant, this one over here, is wicked and says to himself, I love this, Jesus knows that it'll be a little while until he returns. And so he's addressing the fact that 2,000 years ago we might say this to ourselves. My master, whose name is Jesus, is staying away a long time. Have you ever felt that way? Like Jesus, you know, you told these guys you'd be coming back. It's been 2,000 years. Come on. You might be tempted, wicked servant, to say, my master's been gone a long time. And then that servant who's wicked, we don't want to be like, begins to mistreat people. He says, beat his fellow servants. Now, again, he's talking to someone who's within the sound of his voice. So you might even say, uh, beat up other people in church today. Let's, let's give you a visual that you'll never want to see. Beat his fellow servants and, and uh, conclude that I should just eat and drink and be merry. I'll hang out with the drunkards. Now, again, so Jesus is saying, you might be tempted to not be a faithful and wise disciple of Jesus until we're reunited, staying the course for my glory and your joy, by the way. You might be tempted to be this, this wicked servant 
who begins to think, God, you know what? Jesus isn't really in the room. I can do whatever I want to do because it's been 2,000 years anyway, and it'll probably be another 2,000 years. And so, you know what? Let's eat, drink, and be merry like the people in Noah's day. That's the temptation. You say, well, pastor, you know, you're, you're implying that, you know, we don't beat each other up. There's no physical harm in the room. Thank God it's been a little while since that's happened. Just in case you were thinking about it. Let's, let's keep it that way. But let's be honest. Don't we sometimes beat one another up? I mean, it may not be fist blows. Attitudes. Cold shoulders. Unforgiveness. Lack of mercy. Lack of grace. Lack of patience. A short response. A gossip and a slander. I mean, we, we, we know how to beat one another up. Somebody several years ago said the church's biggest problem is that we're cannibals. Elvis said that to me years ago. I don't know if you remember, but you said that to me. Never forgot it. That's one you don't forget. <laughs> Verse 50, Jesus says, The master of that unfaithful, wicked servant, which we don't want to be, who we don't want to be, the master, Jesus, will come. What's he talking about? That blessed hope, that day he's going to show up. He's going to come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. And then verse 51, he, Jesus, for, I really think for the sake of really wanting people to understand the gravity of the moment and the situation is that you're going to give an account, there's judgment, and it's not going to be pretty. In verse 51, I mean, it's, he's like, you know what, you, you, you're a hypocrite. If that's you, and he, he's basically saying, you know what, I don't care how many times you come to church, if you're not living right, if you're not leaning in God's direction, if you're not honest with God and honest with yourself and honest with others, if you're not embracing what it means to be a disciple and to live life on mission for God's glory, then what are you doing? And Jesus is saying, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be tempted to do the things that you know you're not supposed to do, and you're going to justify it, and you're going to, just, you're going to swim in that area of compromise and sin, and you're not going to be ready because you're no longer on watch, you're not anticipating my coming, and you're not living faithfully, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a day of reckoning for you. Why do I say this to you? I don't say this to you to condemn you. I don't know, I don't know most of you personally. I don't know what, you, what you've done this week. I don't know how you're living. I know you're here today. I know you're leaning in God's direction today. I know you're tuned in online. I know you want God's best for your life, and you're not satisfied with anything less, and you want to be found faithful and wise until the day Jesus comes home as your master and says, hey, come on, we're going to a place I've prepared for you. That's who we want to be, amen? Jesus says all of this, and I'll tell you where my mind went. My mind went to another place of scripture. You know, one disciple, one follower of Jesus who was exceptionally close with the Lord, the master, John. And, and John was just, he, he must have just been so sold out to Jesus, Jesus was able to make the most of his willingness and his humility and his faithfulness, his availability, his willingness to take up his cross, all those things. And, and Jesus said, you know what, I want you to take care of my mother when I go back to be with my heavenly father, take care of Mary. And, and John lived a longer life than the others. And John was, as he was faithful, he heard from God. And, and there was a revelation of God to John uh, amidst suffering and things, he was given an, a, 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 a revelation, a picture, a vision of the end times, hundreds of years in the future, things that he could hardly even explain. And he was instructed to write these things down. It's the last book in your Bible. And there are things that are hard to even process and figure out and sort out, and I get all of that. But, but we must be sure we get the basics out of this revelation, right? The fundamentals. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back for us to be ready. And when I hear all these things that Jesus talks about, and he talks about this wicked servant that is, is halfway, maybe, one foot in the world, one foot uh, with the Lord, my mind goes to the messages that were given to John the Revelator in, John, in Revelation chapter 3. And John is given a message to particular churches and speaks truth to them. And when I hear all that Jesus is saying in Matthew 24, my mind jumps to Revelation chapter 3. And if you want to turn there, you can. And, and John is, the word of God is coming to this church in Sardis. And I want to read some of it to you because I, I don't want it, I want to warn us, I don't want it to describe any of you or, or me or us. I know your deeds. 
You've got a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now, you know, so in our day and age, I think if you're here today, you probably, if, you, if you're a churchgoer, you probably have a pretty good reputation. But, but the word of the Lord said that these people who obviously on the outside did what was expected, they looked alive, on, on the inside they weren't. So if that's you today, I just want you to hear from God today. I, I, I'm not trying, I'm not going to pull you up here and, and uh, give you, you know, lashes and punishment. I just want you to hear from God today, amen? Are you ready or not? That's the question today. So, so I know your deeds. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished. You have things to be done for the Lord. Who You, ha- you have not done these things. Remember, therefore, what you have received and what you've heard, hold it fast and repent. Turn from the path you're on, turn to the Lord. But if you do not wake up, I will come and catch the language like a thief. That kind of sounds like what Jesus referenced in Matthew 24. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. Verse 4, yet you have a few people in Sardis, I hope this is true of of us, I hope more than a few, who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. If you've got ears, hear what the Spirit says. That's what the Bible says. So, I mean, so, so you might hear what I just read, Calvary Assembly, and think, Oh, come on, Pastor Dan. We're not that bad. I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm not that ungodly. I'm not that unholy. And and I would just ask you the question, who or what is your standard? And and I don't say that to to make you feel unnecessarily guilty or condemned or lesser than. I just, I want all of us to have a clear picture and a self-evaluation in the the presence of the Lord. I mean, here's the deal. It's your choice. What you do with the Word of God and your life and how you prepare for eternity is your choice. Right? I'm just speaking the truth to you out of love and care and concern for you and honoring God. I mean, the question is, do you want to be ready or not? And how ready do you want to be? When the, when the God of all creation decides that the time is right to have everyone give an account. How ready do you want to be? Revelation 3, you say, Pastor Dan, that's kind of intense. I, I mean, those people were, yeah, we're not that bad. Well, again, being not that bad kind of only takes you from the wicked servant over to somewhere in the middle. Being not that bad. Y'all with me? Because remember Jesus said, you got, faith, you got a faithful and wise servant who's going to be faithfully living for the Lord until he comes, and you've got someone who's wicked. But not that bad, just kind of, to me, just takes you halfway. Yeah. Does that make sense? Let's not go halfway. Let's go all the way. Yeah. What, what does that mean for you, to go all the way with and for Jesus? I mean, have you settled? I just want you to think about these things. Because if you think, well, I'm not that bad, I've got news for you. That's another church in Revelation 3, and the word of God spoke to those servants of God who were not that bad and only halfway, and the Bible says that they're lukewarm. The Bible says they're not hot or cold. Well, let's just see, you want to see what Jesus, what what the word of God says about, about anyone that would land comfortably here, because I think in America in particular, Christians can easily slip our way back to here and feel like, well, I'm not where I used to be, but I'm better than where I used to be. I must be okay. And all I want to say is, don't settle here. Don't stop here. Let's get hot for God. Let's seek his spirit. Let's stay humble before him, dependent upon him, watchful and anticipating and living in light of this edge. He's coming back, ready or not. And so Jesus says this to this church, I know your deeds too. You're neither hot, you're not cold or hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, you're not hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. In other words, in common day lingo, you make me sick if you're here. You say, I'm rich, and so you, in other words, you might be able to justify, oh, I'm doing well, I've acquired wealth, and I don't need anything. In other words, because people will say, well, if I've got a lot, that must mean I'm blessed. Be real careful with that. 
I've got so many things and and I'm wealthy in, in the world's eye. But you do not realize that you are, here's the reality, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, spiritually naked. I counsel you, this is the word of the Lord to people like that. Come to me and buy true value. Gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, spiritually rich, and white clothes to wear, symbolizing forgiveness and righteousness and godliness, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, salve to put on your eyes so you can see clearly again. That's a spiritual awakening. That's what that is. I believe that I believe for many of us, we, we need a spiritual awakening. I, I think we, we need to stop settling and, 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 and feeling like we've arrived and being comfortable and, well, you know, what, what, what's the standard? Who's the standard? Whose word is the standard? The Lord's. What is the Lord speaking to you today, wise and faithful servant? What is the standard for you today? What, what does the watchtower look for you? Where, how should you be anticipating and living in light of the fact that the Lord may come back soon? We've never been closer. And how do you live faithfully as a disciple of Jesus, helping others come to salvation and grow in faith and serving the mission with you? How do you do these things? This is seek the Spirit, surrender, be empowered, and live for God's glory. That's being hot for the Lord. I mean, anything less than is less than. Jesus, or the Word of God says here, and it would be implying the Lord, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Isn't that good? You know, a good parent speaks truth to their kid. And this is what the Bible is meant to do here. So be earnest and repent. There's that word again. Turn. Here I am, familiar passage 20 and 21. Here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I'll come in, I'll eat with that person, and we'll enjoy some good pizza. Without any undue tension or stress like that family gathering you hate to go to. Because it will be well with your soul. To the the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. If you've got ears, listen. That's what he says. Hot or cold, ready or not, how ready do we want to be? I want to be like a Giorgio's pizza, fresh and ready. (laughs) I should have had pizza for everybody today. (laughs) Man, if somebody walks in that door with a pizza right now, that will be it, man. That will... <laughs> living with anticipation of Christ's return will help us live a godly life. If we think Jesus' return is far off in the distant future somewhere, we might lose our sense of urgency to share the gospel. We might slack in our daily discipline to live godly lives, holy lives, righteous living. We might release the passion and discipline and the joy of living a, a life of obedience to God every single day. Then when Jesus comes, we'll find that We're out of time to correct our behavior. Ready or not, Jesus is coming. We cannot simply think of the return of Christ as something in the long distance future. We must be ready for his coming any day, any time. What we believe about Christ's return will either help us stay faithful or it will distract us toward unfaithfulness. The worries and the temptations of life, the diversions of media, and even wholesome ambitions for success can make us forget that we are waiting for something of eternal significance. But waiting requires watching. God is looking for faithful people who will run their race well while they help others run run alongside them toward the finish line. We have a greater capacity to stay faithful to Christ when we keep watch in the company of our brothers and sisters in Christ, waiting together, living faithfully together, so we hope together, ready for the day of his return. I want to invite you to stand with me, and I want to share with you what would be our verse of the week, or verses of the week. Would, I, would you stand with me around the room? And this is Second Peter chapter 3 verses 8 through 10, and I want to pray with and for you. 
And, and just listen to the lace of truth in this completely different part of the Bible that echoes what we just talked today about, both, from, both literally from Genesis and Noah, to Christ in the Gospels, to Christ in Acts, all the way to Revelation and future. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Listen, instead, thank God, He is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come thief, like a thief. Would you bow your heads and just po- po- you know, just kind of pose yourself before the Lord and say, God, I want to be sure I'm hearing from you today. Lord, what is it that you want to speak to me today? Well, what does all of this mean for, for my ways and my priorities, my faith, my living, my witness, my giving, my faithfulness to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ? What does this mean for me? Ready or not? Is it time today, friends, with, again, self-reflection? Is it time to get ready? I mean, gosh, if not now, then when? If not now, then why? Some of you are here today and you're thinking, "Uh, you know what, I I get caught up in the ways of, of life and the world and family and responsibilities and none of it's really terrible, but I need to be more intentional and watch and becoming watchful. I need to pray every day and ask God to help alert me to the opportunity so that I can live faithfully because the time is near. I need to become more faithful. I want to be more faithful in my prayer life and my time in the Word, my time in church. I want to be more about the Father's business. I want to come to prayer tomorrow as we pray and fast. And I want to be involved with others. I want to grow together. I'm going to write follow Jesus on my connect card so I can get engaged with discipleship here at Calvary. Let us know. What does it mean for you to be more faithful? Stop being a closet Christian, maybe. What does it mean for you? Be more gracious, be more Christ-like. Only only God knows what you need to hear. Let Him speak to you. I'm going to pray for for everybody, and and I'm going to let you linger as long as you need to. I always like to let you linger, to listen and respond to the Lord's promptings. Brianna's going to lead us, and and you're welcome to stay. And if you need to go, you can do that starting point. I know all that stuff's going on. But be sure you have your moment with the Lord. With heads bowed, there might be some people in the room today, you're thinking, wow, you know what, you kind of gave me a little bit of a wake-up call, preacher. And if Jesus' words are true, and he did those things that you're talking about that he did, recorded historically in Scripture, and and that day is coming where where he's going to come back the same way he ascended, he's coming back, he's going to rapture the church, That's this blessed hope you're talking about. I I need to make sure I'm ready. I'm not sure if I'm right with God today. Sometimes I'm a good person. Sometimes I come to church. But I'm not sure where I stand with God. Well, good news for you today, friend. You can be sure. Ready or not, not does not need to be in the equation. You can be ready. It's very simple. You pray with me. You make it your prayer. You say, Lord, I've got a little bit of faith here to believe that all this is true. Come on, believers. Pray with me for those who need Jesus. Make it your prayer right now. And you say, you say, Pastor, I just want to be sure. And then you pray this way. You say, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I fall short of your godliness. I believe in Christ. There's something about it. That's crazy. It's extreme. But I do believe he died for me and rose from the grave, conquered it all. And, and he's coming back. And I want to be in heaven with him one day with all you Christian people. Then you make it your prayer right now. And then you let, let somebody know. Tell somebody today. Tell somebody here in the church so we can rally around you, pray with you, and encourage you in the days to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to consider the fact that your word is true. And we build on your word like Matthew tells us to do, on a rock-solid foundation. Not like the unwise servant who builds our lives on everything that this world offers. Today, God, we have a come-to-Jesus moment. We build as faithful and wise servants on the rock and the word of Jesus Christ. We want to live for you. We want to be ready when you return. 
We're living life on mission so that the kingdom of God, as we would pray according to your way of praying, that the kingdom of God would come here and now on earth as it is in heaven. We want to be part of that unfolding. We want to live that way to your good pleasure. Use us, Lord. Use this church. Let us be an influence. Let us be inviters of people to come and, and taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe it comes by way of an, an invitation to the Fall Fest Wednesday. First step toward uh, this circle of believers and considering Christ, who he is. Maybe it's inviting someone to church next week or growth group or youth group, whatever it might be. We want to be faithful. We want to be faithful in our giving and sending missionaries. God, we want to be found doing your work. There are some in the room, Lord, who, who are saying, I just need to be right with God. And so if that's you, friend, make it your prayer. Whisper it with me. Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I heard several times that I need to repent and turn from my sinful, selfish ways. And right now I turn to you, Jesus. I call on you. Forgive me of my sin. I know you died to forgive me. You paid the price, and you're able to do it. I call on you, Jesus, to be my Savior, my forgiver, and my leader in life. Shepherd me like you would a sheep. Where you lead me, I will follow. Now, Lord, show me the next steps, how to get more connected, get water baptized, grow as a disciple. Give me the courage to take those steps of faith. God, grant all of us by the presence of your Holy Spirit the courage to live faithfully for you this week. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed any of those prayers, jot it on your Connect card, drop them in a drop box, tell somebody. If you want to pray with somebody, you come forward. Linger a little bit as Brianna leads us in song. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose The songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. Oh, there will be a day before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the Lord and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice, a thousand generations. Sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Saints, we raise 
so much for this time to spend extra in your presence God and pray if there are still people in here who need that time they need more time to reflect and to spend with you God pray that they would take it there's no greater way to spend our time than in your presence Jesus God I thank you for everything you've done today and everything that you're going to continue to do in the hearts and lives of people here today and watching online and just pray that you would be with us as we come and go and give us safety and bring us safely back together the next time we're here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you are feeling like you need to spend more time in God's presence, feel free. The altars are not closing. But if you feel like you're ready to go, then be blessed and have a great day.